Oops, sorry. It's a great pleasure to actually speak to you on a subject that is very difficult to actually define. And I actually uh, chose this subject because I wrote a book on sleep just recently and I couldn't define what sleep was unless I defined consciousness. Now, the way I'm going to define it is going to be very physiological. I know there will be a lot of in, in, uh, what we call immaterial aspects to consciousness, but I'm going to define it in a very specific way and then show you how neurotransmitters actually play a role. The way to actually explain consciousness is to understand evolution. One of the insights I had when I started looking at neurology and consciousness is to realise that three quarters of your brain, from the premotor back to, to the uh, <coughs> cerebellum, three quarters of your brain is involved in just movement. You think about it, in control of fine movement. Only a quarter of your brain or even less, the prefrontal lobes, are for executive actions and thinking like a human being and being what, who you are. And it was interesting, I was, I was driving down the valley in Brisbane and I saw a, 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 a woman who was obviously mentally impaired standing beside a pub. Where else would they be? And what I noticed was that she had an incredible complex type movement. You notice a lot of mental patients have very complex movements. All right? Always when you look at them, you know, with depression, there'll be movement, tapping, whatever, can't sit still, things like that. There's always a movement component in it. Consciousness arose from that. So I'm going to show you how I looked at it, and I'm going to start back right from the word go. When evolution has started, and we started going on the, on the program of life, we need the sensor, all right? to sense the environment, because if we can't sense the environment, we can't react to it. We then take that information from the sensor, it goes to an integrating center, all right? And then the integrating center gives the response, as you can see there, all right? And that reflex loop occurs throughout the whole body in many, many ways, many, many different ways. It's a very important way. Now, you imagine an amoeba going along, he's sensing the environment, all right? And all of a sudden, he senses some toxic material, things like that. He reacts. Now, he's got, a, he's got a choice. He reacts very fast by withdrawing with his movement backwards, away from that toxic environment. That's safety. So it survives. Okay? But say he's in a soup with other predators around. If he moved very suddenly, as you might imagine, he may cause a, a vibration in the water. And that will then be a sense to some other predator that could say, oh, there's something there and I'll attack it, all right? So what we needed to do is to develop the integrating center, the interneurons, which is this part there, the, this part here, this part here. We sense a number, of, we, get, we, we actually place a number of different interneurons so we could slow down the movement or reaction, twist slightly different, and so you're not observed as a defensive mechanism. So you, you develop that. But remember, you've got five senses, all right? And basically, if you look at the, the, the uh, basal part of the brain, the medulla obligata, the arousal systems and things like that, you'll find that that's the reflex it's got. It's like a crocodile, <laughs> you know? It just reacts, doesn't it? You know, when he bites or sees a bit of food, he just, <laughs> there's no thinking, he just does it. But imagine you've got five senses. You get a little bit more higher you got five senses, and basically you've got sight, you've got hearing, you've got feeling, you've got touch, you've got chemical type senses. Now, you've got the integrating neurons going on. Which one of those are you going to take, take as the definitive one that you're going to react to to the environment? You got, and you may have uh, some sense of a sound coming in, a, t uh, a sight sense, and they may be contradictory. How do you resolve that? How does the brain resolve that? All right? It does that by creating another hierarchy. From the simple sense, you create what we call a limbic system, an emotional system. And what does the emotional system do other than give you what we call qualia? It gives you a quality of the sense. It, so every sense that comes in, it tags it with a quality. I like it, I dislike it, it's painful, it's horrible, <laughs> whatever it is. It's a qualia. All right? and, we, and eventually it develops into what we call an emotional system. 
Now remember that qualia, that reflex action, is all unconscious. There's no thinking involved. All that's happening is that the evolutionary pattern is basically putting a tag on that system and giving it a, 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 a feeling, a mood, and things of that nature. Okay? But what happens, once again, you can have paradoxical feelings about a person, can't you? You can love them and hate them at the same time. Which one are you going to do? What are you going to do? How are you going to resolve that? Pain and happiness, pain and pleasure. You know, how are you going to resolve that? So the body and then the evolution, as you might say in a simplistic way, evolves another hierarchy. And that's the intellectual hierarchy, the prefrontal lobes. All right? And it does basic what it does what does it, it do? It discriminates from all those choices and uses past history because during this process of evolution, memory is being created. All right, of past experiences and things like that. With the qualia, the amygdala and hippocampus are part of the short term and long term memory of that area. All right? But when we get in the prefrontal lobes, we then basically get long term memory, short term memory and working memory. All right? That's what happens. That's how I look at it from an evolutionary point of view. So we start off in our evolutionary thing to sense the environment. We react to the environment appropriately. All right? And then eventually as we evolve more and more, we not, we not only just perceive the environment, all right, we try to anticipate the environment, to predict the environment. And then eventually at the human point, we create the environment. And you've got that kind of ladder of evolution that occurs. So the question is, when does consciousness occur? Sorry. Right, eh? sorry. Right. So what, what happens then is that during the process of this evolutionary process, which is basically unconscious, all right, and then all of a sudden we get the prefrontal lobes, this, you know, and you've got this information and things like that, and the information has been sieved, it's been sorted, it's been tagged with qualia, all right, and you've got all this information now. How do you bring that all together so you could react to the environment appropriately? Well, you have a quantum collapse. What happens is that basically the information that comes in is integrated and it collapses. And when it collapses, all waveforms collapse to one form, you get an instant of consciousness. An instant of consciousness. Now, to get to that point from, from all those senses to that instant of consciousness takes 0.75 of a second. 0.75 of a second. And when the wave equations collapse, as you understand quantum physics, you get all the information that is pertinent from all the senses that you've got that demonstrates to you in a visual or mental or abstractural form a scene in your head. And that only lasts three seconds. So consciousness is a static thing. It's not Seeming, we think it's flowing, but really it is a static thing. All right? And then what happens is that to make it flow, you have to have time vectors. And they're in the prefrontal lobe. And the time vectors are basically a cycle. You know, when you play a piano, you have that little clock. It beats. All right? That's what you have in the in your brain. You have a clock for retention which is 40 cycles per second. And that 40 cycles kind of allows the information to flow like, like, a, like you know, when, when you watch a movie, what is, what is a movie other than a sheet of static pictures moving along? That's all it is, isn't it? That is what your consciousness is. And what you're doing is at every 40th of a cycle, or one, one cycle, you know, your 40 cycle, you've got an image, you've got an image, and you get that flow of consciousness. 